Hello, welcome to the debate on Sky News. I'm Martin Stanford. Here's our take on developments brought together from America, the UK and around the world. The shrewd reformer of the church without borders, the Pope in America. But how much support does he have? I believe that I'm being called to lead by helping to clear the field. Another one down, another 14 to go. Is the Republican presidential campaign suffering from crisis and some confusion? You will have noticed Pope Francis is in America. And by the end of his tour, the pontiff will have addressed the United Nations, visited the White House and spoken out unambiguously on issues of pro-life, pro-choice, single-sex marriage, divorce and contraception. But his biggest challenge will be enhancing the Catholic Church in the US. Well, as usual, the Democrat commentator Jeffrey Robinson is standing by for us in New York and the Conservative commentator Armstrong Williams is also ready to talk to us in Washington. Jeffrey, do you welcome the Pope's visit? Well, of course, why not? He's a man of peace, he's a man of faith. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like we say in New York about chicken soup. It may not help, but it couldn't hurt. And Armstrong, is his visit now particularly useful? You know, um, no matter what your faith is, everybody knows the story about St. Peter as head of the church. Uh, becoming the first bishop, and it's been passed along that the, that the Pope is the head of the church here on earth. And what the Pope does, and what he represents, and what he transcends is he represents morality, how to treat your neighbor, how to take care of communities, how to smile and, and give these warm embraces. Even before his visit to the ceremony with the president, he stopped and hugged people. He reached out to them because that's where he's most comfortable. He reminds us of the best of us. He transcends politics. Uh, he transcends all the things that divide us. And for all of us, whether we're atheists, agnostic, whether we're Christians, whether we're Muslim, the pro represents a piece of all of us. He's a part of all that broken glass that is one frame when you think about him. And so at a time when you think about what's going on in the world, abroad and at home in the United States, he reminds us of the best of us, of what our true purposes are, Beyond all the politics and everything else, we are moral beings who strive to be good, find good in others, and do good where we are. Well, let's bring in another voice here. Jessica Martinez is from the Pew Research Center. She's at their headquarters in Washington, D.C. Jessica, for, thanks for joining us today. Is Catholicism alive and thriving in the USA? Well, our recent surveys suggest that the share of U.S. adults who identify as Catholic has begun to decline somewhat, but it's still about one in five who tell us in their surveys that they identify as Catholic, and so it's still a large share of the American population. Is there a reason for the decline? Is it the nature of the teaching, the strictures, the restrictions that's put on your life? Well, there are a couple of things that we can point to that are behind a more broad pattern of religious change in the United States. And so we're seeing an increasing share of people who have no religious affiliation at all, people who say they're either atheist or agnostic or nothing in particular. And to some degree, this is a generational story. It's generational replacement. Younger people in the U.S. are less likely to identify with any particular religion. And so as younger generations replace older generations, uh, this is changing the landscape overall. Uh, it's also somewhat due to religious switching. So among all people raised as Catholic in the United States, about half say they leave the church at some point in their lives. Some of them come back, about one in 10, but about four in 10 people who were raised Catholic have left the church. So within the Christian um, umbrella, which is the most successful subset, if you like? If Catholicism's failing a bit, is it the evangelical church that's winning? Well, we see some decline in the Protestant share overall in the in the U.S. as well. It's less pronounced among the evangelical church, but it's really the unaffiliated share that's growing. Let's bring in the uh, other two as well here, Jeffrey and um, Armstrong. Jeffrey, as ever, you're shaking your head. What's up? Yeah, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm amazed at uh, at Jessica's research, and I don't doubt it. But I've seen other other uh, uh, statistics that show that of people who identify themselves as Catholics. 45% attend weekly church services, 35% uh, uh, much less often or never. 
But with the growing Hispanic population, with the Latino population growing in the United States, uh, all of whom are Catholic, I'm, I'm quite surprised. Of course, there are political differences between life in America and the strict teachings of the Catholic Church. But Pope Francis is addressing a lot of these. And I wouldn't be surprised if church uh, attendance goes up in the, in the wake of his visit. Is that an automatic response, do you think, Armstrong, that you'd expect those of a Catholic faith, or particularly of none, to show a refresh interest in the church as a result of the Pope being in the United States? You know, I don't, I've never believed that sampling a few thousand people can determine whether or not people are attending church, whether people are exiting the Catholic faith. I, I've never bought into that. You know, when I, when I go to church on Sundays and I find myself, because it's convenient, oftentimes in Catholic churches to listen to the homily. And when I'm there, the church is packed. And I mean, I'm not just talking about uh, here in Washington, D.C., when I can find churches in New York that also happen to be Catholic. I think no matter what happens in the world, when you face the kind of crises that we kids, we continue to face, the senseless killings, I think people find refuge in the church. People find refuge in their faith. And I also think that uh, the Pope has addressed head-on uh, the pedophilia in the Catholic Church, where they've started this very painful process of cleaning that up and writing that. He's willing to speak out on it. He's not, he doesn't shy away from it. And I think that is an indication as to why um, tithes and donations in the Catholic Church are on the rise again. I, I think the faceplate of all this is Pope Francis. I mean, um, he is very difficult to criticize. Many people try to put him in a liberal box. There are those that try to put him in a conservative box. But what he does, he carries out the teachings um, that is expected for him in terms of the man who's representative of the head of the church here on earth. And I think as long as you don't have the scandals and as long as people believe that your heart is in the right place and you touch people regardless, because we all are sinners, I think you draw more and more people in. That's why I think it's important to see the Pope in, in Cuba uh, sitting down with Raul Castro. I think it's important to read stories about the Pope working behind the scenes to bring down that um, regime in, in Cuba and also whispering in the president's ear when he visited him a year ago, we've got to do more. You've got to support Cuba. You've got to lift the embargo. And it had an impact. So this pope is not just involved in the morals. He is, he's been doing it in a political way where you have these people who refuse to come together and they still live by these same old laws and rules of 40 and 50 years ago. So I think this pope is going to do more than any pope in recent memory to bring people back to church, but also bring people back to their moral compass. Jessica, there is, though, a wonderful collision, isn't there, which may or may manifest itself during the visit in a very explicit way between the Pope's teachings or Christian teaching and some of the big political discussions of our age about pro-life, about pro-choice. And aren't Americans famously independent about this? They don't want to be told by anybody how to live their lives. Well, we find in our surveys that Catholics uh, disagree with the church on a lot of these issues, or, or at least divided to some degree. So, for example, um, most Catholics don't think it's sinful to use contraception, and three-quarters would like to see the church allow it. Uh, uh, Catholics are, are a little bit more divided when it comes to abortion. About half think it should be legal in all or most cases. Um, the other half think it shouldn't. Um, when it comes to same-sex marriage, Catholics, like the rest of the general public in the, in the United States, have increasingly uh, favored same-sex marriage. A majority think that it should be legal, uh, but they're more divided over whether the church should recognize this or not. So we see a lot of variety in the opinions of Catholics when it comes to these kinds of matters. I mean, Jeffrey, on the question of something like divorce, it's an anachronism, isn't it, that you, in this day and age you shouldn't be able to get divorced, fall in love again, and get the church's blessing on your second union? Well, I mean, in this country where, what is it, one-third of, uh, of couples get a divorce, uh, or nearly half, I guess, now. Uh, but Pope Francis is addressing this in his redefinition of, uh, of annulment. I mean, the, the man, the thing that fascinates me about the man is not only is he a rock star, as was John Paul II, and very popular, it has to do with his humanism. He actually appears to be somebody who understands real life in the real world, as opposed to some of the... Uh, past popes, who seemed very distant and uh, uh, autocratic. Jeffrey, is he going to be all right? Because I notice the security arrangements for this visit are unconventional, aren't they, for a, for a major dignitary uh, visiting the country? Well, the Secret Service is in charge of VIP visits to the country, foreign visitors to the dignitaries to the country. Uh, and I wrote a book with my college friend Joe Petro called Standing Next to History, 
And Joe, who had been uh, Reagan's Secret Service guy, left the White House in 85 to spend a year putting together the papal visit of 86 with John Paul II. And one of the first things that Joe did was go to Rome and look at the Pope Mobile. And he said, I don't like this. It was open. And he had Pope Mobile sent to the Secret Service garage, and he rebuilt the Pope Mobile so that when he was sitting in the front seat next to the driver, he had free access to the Pope uh, just behind him. And the Pope was enclosed in the bubble. Now, don't forget, John Paul II had been shot. There had been an assassination attempt. So Joe says he was easy to protect because he understood. This Pope is now in an open Pope mobile. Uh, and I know a lot of the Secret Service are very upset about this. They should have said to the Vatican people, certainly to the archdiocese involved uh, in America and to Homeland Security, no, he will be enclosed. We will protect him. That's our job. He's on American soil. Somebody overruled the Secret Service, and he's now in this open Pope mobile. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to protect him. Also, he's coming to New York in the middle of UN week when there are 500 other people needing protection. So the Secret Service is stretched. It's a very dangerous moment. Now, I'm counting on them to, to, to prevail and to keep him safe, but the conditions under which they're working are adverse and not at all the safest. Well, let's hope uh, your reassurances on that score are absolutely okay, uh, Jeffrey. Jessica, a final thought for you that as this visit pans out, it may well be, when you add up the score at the end of it, it could be as many people of another faith or of none have gone to, in some way, interact with the Pope as diehard Catholics. Well, we certainly see that uh, U.S. adults have a very favorable view of Pope Francis, and so there's a lot of interest in his visit among Catholics and non-Catholics, and so uh, it'll be interesting to see what the reaction is among Catholics and non-Catholics alike. Jessica Martinez at the Pew Research Center, thank you very much. Thanks. A reminder, you can catch up on the Sky News debate on Apple TV, on Roku, on Catch Up, and of course at skynews.com slash US. Now, it's been another fascinating week for watchers of the Republican presidential contest. Governor Scott Walker was the nation's number one Republican presidential contender in March. Now, he's withdrawn. Hero to zero in six months, you could say. There were also calls for no Muslims in the White House. And in one poll, Carly Fiorina has unseated Donald Trump at the top of the power rankings. Well, Brad Blakeman is in D.C. He's a former senior advisor to George W. Bush and a veteran of past presidential campaigns. So, Brad, I bet you're watching this one with interest. Does Mr. Walker's disappearance matter? Well, we're, we're sad to see him go. He's a successful a governor of an important electoral state. Uh, but, you know, that's what happens in politics. Uh, you, you know, what goes up must come down sometimes. And uh, although we're sad to see him go, he's still going to be a force within the Republican Party. But that creates opportunities for the other. And many others will be dropping out over the coming months as, as the field whittles down. And primaries and caucuses in America, an important process to make sure we get the best possible candidate for the general election. Uh, the Trump glow, that's dimmed a little bit this last week. Do you think he's on his way out as well? He himself calls himself an entertainer. And uh, people have seen this show many, many times. So he's got to get some new material if he's to stay relevant. But once we start getting into policy like we saw in the last debate, uh, that's where he doesn't shine. He's really good on rhetoric and substance. Well, let's bring in Jeffrey Robinson in New York, Armstrong Williams in Washington. And Armstrong, we should say that you are, of course, the business manager of one of the contenders who hasn't withdrawn yet. Uh, is he staying in the race? Are you kidding me? He's number three uh, in, the, in the race. Why would he withdraw? That's, a, uh, that's an interesting question. Of course he's not withdrawing. It was a facetious question, Armstrong, um, and I withdraw the facetious question. Uh, I, I, he's, done, he's done rather well, but let's clear up this question of Muslims in the White House. Uh, was he taken out of context? Was there some misunderstanding here? Because certainly over here in London, we got it as a rather bold statement that no Muslim should ever be elected president. Was it as simple as that? Well, Dr. Carson made it clear to Chuck Todd on NBC Meet the Press that in terms of his preference and his personal choice, he would not advocate a Muslim becoming president of the United States. They did not ask him a constitutional question. 
They did not ask him an Article 6 question. He only responded to what he would do personally. And what most people don't realize, and it's sad that many Americans in their heart of hearts, if you ask them that question, many of them agree with Dr. Carson. Jeffrey, do you agree with Dr. Carson? Of course not, on anything, on anything at all. What that statement showed was his, his xenophobia. The man is a homophobe anyway. He, uh, he is, uh, has got ridiculous views on science, for a man of science. He denies uh, the constitutional right of anyone to run for office without a religious test. I mean, the guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He's driving the clown car, and it's now filled with a lot of people. But to Brad's point about, uh, about Donald Trump, Listen, if it wasn't for Trump, nobody would have watched that debate. They're, they're all losers. There isn't a single leader among them. There's nobody worth watching except for Donald Trump. He's bringing the audience. And as for Carly Farina, who's now number two, which means that Dr. Carson wins the bronze medal, right? Gold, silver, bronze. Now, bronze medal means you lost the race. So, I mean, he's he's a loser and he's out of it. He won't survive uh, New Hampshire and, and, uh, okay. and well, the primaries. Let me just say one thing about Carly Farina. She reminds me of everybody's ninth grade gym teacher whom we detested. She's the ninth grade girl's gym teacher who nobody could stand. Watch her, watch her work and lie about her, uh, her track record at, uh, at Hewlett Packard. It's amazing that she can get away with this stuff. She won't last either. Okay, well, there's uh, quite a few predictions from Jeffrey there. Brad, let me toss it back to you. Uh, ben Carson, did he damage his campaign, do you think, with his remark? Sure he did. Uh, he should be repudiated for his remarks. He knows better than that. I would hope. And look, as a Republican, if we don't police our own, then shame on us. And Dr. Carson, his remarks were way beyond the pale. He knows that. And uh, and look, we got to call it as we see it. He was wrong. Uh, his his uh, explanation was even worse. And those people who stand up for him, shame on them as well. Right. And may I respond? May I respond? Of course you and may. This is why, and this is why the establishment like Brad and others have no idea. I'm not establishment that is that, wait a second may, may wait i a finish second. may i finish see, may i finish did see, i interrupt you see, may see, i finish i did see, not see, interrupt see, you may I finish? Hey, hey, hang on brad a second let armstrong say his words here armstrong. Your own failure. I, and that, I must have struck a nerve he can't be quiet can i finish that is why the establishment people like brad doesn't understand what's going on with this country. Americans want honesty. Even if you don't like the honesty, Dr. Carson told the truth. He's willing to stand beside it. And, and that is why outsiders, whether it's on the Republican side or the Democratic side, are doing well. Because Americans are repudiating the establishment. Brad Blakeman. Being the establishment is not being hateful. Being the establishment is not denigrating an entire religion. Exactly what Dr. Carson did. I lost a nephew on 9-11. He was a first responder. He was murdered by Muslim extremists, radical Islamists. But I don't condemn the entire religion for his loss. Quite the contrary. And, and I repudiate the comments of Dr. Carson, who repudiated an entire religion, who said that he's not comfortable with a Muslim being president. And I am. If the American people elect a Muslim president who puts his hand on the Quran and says that he swears allegiance to the United States to support and defend the Constitution, he will be my president. You see, Jeffrey, uh, all this discussion, whether or not it actually helps the Republican cause, maybe is a mute point, but it certainly keeps them in the headlines, doesn't it? Well, it keeps them in the headlines, but, you know, uh, it, being talked about is, is uh, not necessarily better than being true and, and being respected. And for the first time in my life, I have to say, Brad, I usually disagree with just about everything you say. I am 100% on your side in this one. Good for you to stand up to, to Armstrong and, and Ben Carson, because what he said was so, so absolutely unsavory that it shows he is completely unqualified to run for office. I mean, I can't wait for the man right. to take a serious beating and return to the political obscurity he so richly deserves. Well, I tell you what, let, let's see if uh, Armstrong can bring him back into the conversation on this show at some future date. I want to ask about the other candidates, because there are a lot of others. And um, Brad, seeing as we've got you on the show, let's talk about Carly Fiorina. Jeffrey was disparaging, as it is won't. <laughs> but I thought she did rather well in those debates. And subsequently, and gym teacher or no, she's a real contender, right? She is. I mean, she schooled the rest of the candidates up there. Many of them were professional politicians. And the fact of the matter is, leaders are never appreciated in their time, great leaders. 
It's only after time when you can take a full and fair assessment of the tough decisions they made. And even the director who, who voted to fire Carly is now in her corner because he realizes the decisions she made now were in the best interest of the company then and now as we look back, uh, they were the right decisions at the time. So oh, yeah. Carly has a lot to offer. She, she's shown herself to be a leader, decisive, clear, concise, and, and knowledgeable. And she's certainly going to be a contender as we move forward in this race. And Armstrong, could I ask you just to be generous about another candidate for a moment? Um, America has been saying for a while, in another context, it's time for a woman to rule the White House. Could Carly Fiorina be that woman? Of course. And uh, we have much respect for not only Ms. Fiorina, but all the candidates who make the sacrifice, who have their reputations bludgeoned and their remarks take out of, taken out of context, who love this country and who wanted to run and serve it. It was a sad day when Scott Walker had to exit the race. We lost something. Even Donald Trump, as Jeffrey said, bring people to these debates and people get to introduce themselves to Republican ideas. And so we celebrate all these candidates. And certainly Ms. Fiorina is formidable and should do well. But yes, it's at some point, the showbiz, the razzmatazz and the attention seeking has to give way to serious politics, Armstrong, doesn't it? When does that point come, do you think, in the American calendar? Well, you know, this is a marathon, not a sprint. It's early on in the season. We've already seen signs of people dropping out like Rick Perry and Scott Walker. We By December, there should be more dropping out. But uh, we're pretty confident, and I know Brad may hate this, uh, that Trump, Carson, and Fiorina will be around for the long haul. And I think America should brace themselves that one of those three could possibly become the Republican nominee. I'm just curious if they become the Republican nominee, if it's Trump or Carson, would Brad support them or will he just decide to embrace a third party and vote for the Democrat? Dunno, let's ask him, Brad, what will you do? I would not support Donald Trump. No way. I would not support Dr. Carson. No way. I may support the arena if it gets to that point. But uh, the country needs uh, leaders who would uphold the Constitution. And I believe that uh, Dr. Carson has shown himself not to be knowledgeable, number one, and not to believe in our Constitution as written. And I think Donald Trump is, is what he claims to be, and that's an entertainer. Uh, and Jeffrey, this process, which, let's face it, the Democrats are going through a, a similar show, maybe not quite so colorful right now, but who knows what surprises they've got through us come another few months down the track. Does it actually help the body politic, I wonder, or is it all a bit too ridiculous for that? You know, I hate to say it, but politics has become show business. Uh, and it started way back in 1960 at that Kennedy-Nixon debate when Nixon sweated and Kennedy was really good on television. And that was the beginning of it. We can trace it right up to now to, to Donald Trump. Now, I think Trump's got a real shot at it. Carly Farina doesn't. She will, she's, uh, she's gone pretty soon. Ben Carson, listen, Armstrong, I'd love to see Ben Carson be the nominee. Hillary would win 75 states and there are only 50. He couldn't win a single state. I mean, I would love it. But it is about show business. Uh, don't rule Jeb Bush out quite yet. And although Kasich uh, it probably can't get the nomination because he's a, a, a Republican in name only, he's actually a viable politician. Uh, he's a man who lacks a little bit of personality. But I, I can see a Kasich coming through. Rubio did pretty well in those debates, although Rubio's got a lot of other problems, uh, including being a, a, a teenager running for uh, president of his high school. I mean, that's, he's, I think he's a joke as well. But watch Jeb Bush. He's got a lot of money behind him, and the other candidates don't even come close in money. I think Jeb Bush is a viable candidate. So, Brad Blakeman, if you were a betting man, would you still advise us maybe to put a few dollars on a Clinton-Bush runoff? No, I think, quite frankly, and I've said this many times, I think the country is Bush and Clinton out. You know, you, you're, you're from England, and, and if you recall, we fought a revolution because we didn't have fancy uh, familial rule. And, and I, I think that it's healthy to have new, fresh blood in our country. And that's why I believe the best possible candidates for president, vice president, may turn out to be Kasich and Rubio. Uh, it, it's two important battleground states of Florida and Ohio. is a must-win. Republicans never won without it and their fresh new faces and their current um, office holders. So I wouldn't count out uh, Kasich Rubio. I think, yes, Bush certainly has a chance. But I think uh, while um, it's the year of the insider 2015, 2016 may be the year of the outsider. Well, 
Uh, if I could use a cliche and a, a, maybe an apt quote, it ain't over till it's over, of course. And that brings True. us to a sad passing this week, that of Yogi Berra. Um, Jeffrey, it's a bit of a handbrake turn from uh, the politics to the show business of sport, I suppose. But it is a sad day, isn't it? It's, it's not the show business of sport. It's the show business. It's the, 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 the passing of an American legend, of an icon. Uh, Yogi Berra transcended sport. He was a, a philosopher. He was the man who said, when you, in life, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. He was the man who said, <laughs> uh, uh, you should always go to other people's funerals or they won't come to yours. He was also the man who very famously said, it ain't over till it's over. And Yogi, it ain't over. See you, pal. Armstrong, any thoughts on Yogi Berra? Uh, listen, he's a part of all of us. He's as, a, he's as an American as the apple pie and the Chevrolet. He's an icon. It's, it's, a, it's an iconic figure that will never die. He will always be a part of our sports history and sports lore. And I think all the things that Jeffrey said I agree with, especially Brad. It ain't over until it's over. <laughs> there speaks a campaign manager. Brad, uh, it's a sad day of passing, but as, you, as Jeffrey's intimated, he, he entertained the nation for many a long year, didn't he? Well, you know, this is, isn't it ironic? We're here to beat up each other on, on, on politics, but yet what do Americans together is sport. Um, and, and that's the common denominator in, in many countries, whether it's soccer, baseball, football, is sports tends to be the thing that joins a nation. And Yogi Berra was part of an iconic team, the Yankees. I'm from New York. I, I grew up a Yankees fan. I remain a Yankees fan. And, and going to that stadium and thinking about all the legends that played there. And as a role model up in sports was Yogi Berra. So uh, he's had a fantastic career, and he's always stayed true to himself and his sport, and he'll most be remembered for being so iconic as an American sports hero. Jeffrey, Brad, Armstrong, thank you all very much indeed. And that's it for this edition of The Debate. You can continue watching Sky News on Apple TV, on Roku, on Catch Up, and, of course, at skynews.com. Until next time, goodbye.